I will try to focus mostly on the biochemical and, and enzymo enzymological aspects of the research that my group's been doing at Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, I guess by way of introduction, the, I was invited by uh, Dr. Borosh to speak at this meeting because uh, of a paper on deuterium depleted water and how it may uh, act as an adjuvant with certain anti-cancer chemotherapies. And as you know, some of these uh, accelerate fatty acid metabolism. So I uh, would like to talk about one of the most important fatty acid metabolizing enzymes in our bodies, uh, cyclooxygenases, and how uh, many of uh, their reactions are characterized by large deuterium isotope effects, which may give rise to the level of discrimination that's required for, for deuterium depleted water to exert its effects. Badly, that last is not here. Okay, so uh, a word about uh, cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenase two and cyclooxygenase one are two protein isoforms. Cyclooxygenase one has been known for 30 some odd years, cyclooxygenase two just for about 10. There's only one specific inhibitor for cyclooxygenase two that's FDA approved. Uh, it has uh, minimal gastric side effects, and um, the reason why there is only one drug on the market is because uh, in one in a hundred patients, there are cardiotoxic side effects, and they are not very well understood. It has to do with the, the imbalance of, of prostanoids formed as a result of fatty acid oxidation. Um, another reason to be interested in this enzyme is it's a primary player in inflammation. Um, this is just a, a showing you neuroinflammation. Uh, as far as um, cyclooxygenase goes, one can imagine taking a cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor and then going out and playing football and being hit in the head and, and not being irreparably damaged and having a career outside of your college sports. Uh, and this is actually an important uh, factor in uh, American athletics. Okay, so uh, moving on to this, the uh, chemistry and biochemistry here. Uh, these structures are of cyclooxygenase one, isoform one, and isoform two. They're virtually identical. They have 60% structural homology, as you see, there's a heme prosthetic group in both proteins, uh, and it turns out that this tyrosine here forms a catalytic radical. Um, the two substrates I'm showing bound in the enzyme active site are omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids. They have weak CH bonds that are easily oxidized. Uh, arachidonic acid is the enzyme's native substrate. And linoleic acid is something we've used, uh, an analog we've used as a model substrate. As you see, they bind similarly in this L-shaped conformation. Uh, one other thing I'd like to point out is this tyrosine-334, which is not critical for catalysis, but it hydrogen bonds to the catalytic tyrosine and is allegedly uh, involved in its selective formation upon oxidation of the ferric protoporphyrin 9 prosthetic group by the product hydroperoxides formed as a result of dioxygenase activity. So this enzyme has both a peroxidase and dioxygenase function, and I'll come back to that later. So uh, this is just a close-up of what I said already. Um, the reaction chemistry that occurs Whoops, the reaction chemistry that occurs uh, involves the generation of this oxidized uh, metalloporphyrin as a ferial porphyrin radical cation, often referred to as compound one. Um, it is able to uh, pick out this one tyrosine out of 20 within 15 angstroms of uh, the prosthetic group 
and oxidize it selectively. That's not to say it doesn't migrate through the protein on longer time scales, but it is selectively formed, and this tyrosine 334 is just a bystander in the process. Um, we believe that this occurs by a proton coupled electron transfer mechanism, which may be ubiquitous in, in biology, especially in, in enzymes that use radicals to catalyze reactions. Um, and these are reactions, again, of uh, fatty acid oxidations at the weak bisallylic CH bonds. So arachidonic acid oxidation uh, is shown here. The primary product of this prochiral substrate upon binding to either cyclooxygenase is prostaglandin G2. It has five chiral centers in the molecule. These acyclic hydroproxy icosatetraenoic acids uh, are formed in smaller quantities. However, upon treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the amount of those can increase significantly and, and potentially have carcinogenic effects. Okay, so this uh, slide was lifted from a, an excellent review in science by Colin Funk where described uh, various cyclooxygenase inhibitors. But what I'd like to point out is that uh, cyclooxygenase works within the cell and on cells nearby. So the prostaglandin, the prostaglandin H2 formed from arachidonic acid, this is a two electron reduced form of prostaglandin G2, uh, is uh, taken up by platelets, endothelial cells, uh, the, the, re the cells of the female reproductive system, immune cells, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, there are all sorts of prostaglandin synthases that cause these downstream effects from uh, hemostasis to uh, modulating uh, the vasculature and uh, pain, fever, inflammation, uh, as well as other physiological syndromes. So my lab uh, has uh, approached uh, the mechanistic uh, study of cyclooxygenase by first looking at a model substrate in comparison to arachidonic acid. And linoleic acid just has two fewer double bonds and two fewer carbons, okay? And as a result, it only incorporates one equivalent of oxygen into the product and makes the 9R and 13S hydroperoxy octadecadienoic acids as the primary products. And if you look down here, this is a snapshot of uh, the uh, cyclooxygenase 1, numbering slightly mm -hmm. different, uh, with the catalytic tyrosyl radical. The yellow is the reactive hydrogen. Upon abstraction of that hydrogen by the tyrosyl mm -hmm. radical, uh, oxygen attacks at the adjacent uh, 9R and 13S, or sorry, the 9 and 13 carbons to make the 9R and 13S HPODEs. Uh, and these are subsequently reduced to the uh, hydroxy octadecadienoic acids by the peroxidase activity. All right, so as I said, cyclooxygenase 1 has been known for many, many years, and it's present in nearly every cell. Uh, there are many drugs that have been developed and are over-the-counter inhibitors like aspirin, for which a Nobel Prize was awarded, uh, and ibuprofen, acetaminophen. Uh, this enzyme has high substrate specificity, meaning that it reacts with arachidonic acid much faster or with a greater turnover rate constant than linoleic acid. On the other hand, cyclooxygenase 2, which is 60% identical yet a different gene product, it's formed from a gene on a different chromosome, um, has, has much uh, more promiscuous uh, activity. Uh, if you correct for the amount of oxygen consumed upon oxidizing these substrates, 
the uh, turnover rate constants were es essentially identical. Um, Cyclooxygenase 2 can be either induced in immune cells or it can be constitutively found in the brain. Um, there are certain non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that cause the formation of the acyclic hydroperoxy uh, icosatetraenoic acids, as I said, that have uh, some uh, potential for carcinogenic activity. And uh, when we first began studying uh, these enzymes, we worked with cyclooxygenase 1, which you can isolate from REM seminal vesicles. Uh, there was no expression system at the time in 2007. Uh, we studied the kinetics of its reaction, uh, looking at the apparent second order rate constant for the consumption of linoleic acid at varying oxygen concentrations and vice versa, the apparent second order rate constant for the consumption of oxygen at varying linoleic acid concentrations, you see this increasing hyperbolic behavior, which is the hallmark of a random sequential kinetic mechanism. And I'll explain further what that means. It just describes a sequence in which substrates bind. And because it's random, I'm saying that there's no preferred order of oxygen binding before the fatty acid, or vice versa. And this is simply the, the, the rate expression that describes the kinetics, and we could go through that later on. So one of uh, the confounding things we discovered early on was that there was little pH dependence and virtually no solvent isotope effect on the reaction. Uh, we now understand that the reason for this is because there's slow solvent exchange into the active site. And therefore, on the time scale of catalysis, you don't have scrambling of uh, the uh, deuterons from D2O into the, the reactive position of the tyrosine, for instance. However, we were able to measure competitive oxygen kinetic isotope effects. And this was alluded to earlier this morning. Uh, we use isotope ratio mass spectrometry where uh, natural abundance oxygen is the substrate, and we look at how the isotope content changes as the enzyme consumes oxygen along with the substrate. And as you see here, uh, and I'll get into this in, in more detail what this means, the isotope effects are, are virtually identical for arachidonic acid and linoleic acid, indicating that the first irreversible step after oxygen enters the catalytic cycle is most likely the same, okay? So um, the uh, study of isotope effects, deuterium isotope effects specifically in the cyclooxygenases has been riddled with difficulty, <laughs> fraught with complexity. Uh, Tritium isotope effects and deuterium isotope effects have been me measured under steady state conditions as well as single turnover conditions. And the only thing that's been observed are very small values for these isotope effects. And this is in large part because the researchers at the time neglected to worry about the concentration of the co-substrate oxygen. They just used air-saturated solutions were oxygen-saturated solutions where uh, there was basically no dependence of the rate constant on O2. And therefore, these values are, are potentially obscured by kinetic complexity. I'm going to grab a different laser pointer very quickly. So uh, my lab uh, has developed techniques for varying oxygen and oops, all three. Um, so uh, not only did we look at this model substrate, um, but we looked at uh, the dependence of uh, the labeled labeling the substrate on the rate constant for the consumption of oxygen. And as you see here with linoleic acid, even though it reacts 
with cyclooxygenase 2 at a nearly identical rate as arachidonic acid, the isotope effects on these kinetic parameters are greatly elevated. Uh, 6.2 is a modest isotope effect as far as I'm concerned. However, if you look at the temperature dependence of that isotope effect, it's clear that there's some quantum mechanical nature to the hydrogen transfer. And what I said at the outset of this talk was that perhaps the isotope discrimination caused by these fatty acid oxidizing enzymes could give rise to some of the, the discrimination that's seen when deuterium depleted water is used as an adjuvant in anti-cancer chemotherapies where fatty acid metabolism is accelerated. So uh, some nuances of the chemistry. Uh, you can resolve a solvent kinetic isotope effect when you use the proteated linoleic acid, but when you use the deuterated linoleic acid, uh, the uh, very large isotope effect on the turnover rate constant just causes the solvent isotope effect to vanish. Okay, it causes the solvent isotope effect to vanish. You see the same rate constants in H2O and D2O. Um, you can actually reconstitute the native uh, cyclooxygenases with uh, a manganese protoporphyrin 9. And the peroxidase activity is somewhat attenuated, but uh, the dioxygenase activity with linoleic acid and arachidonic acid is essentially the same. What differs, however, is the dependence of the rate constants on phenol concentration. And phenol acts as an antioxidant. And basically, it feeds into the peroxidase catalytic cycle, stabilizes the enzyme, um, and uh, actually, optimizes it for activity with respect to oxygen consumption. That is, the tyrosyl radical that's responsible for dioxygenase activity is formed more effectively. And you could see that with this, this behavior with the proteated linoleic acid and the native enzyme. Looking at the manganese enzyme, because peroxidase activity is slower, you see less of a phenol dependence. And with the deuterated substrate, because product hydroperoxide products are formed more slowly, there's less need for the antioxidant, and that's why there's virtually no dependence on phenol. So this was important to optimize in order to study the kinetics under limiting conditions, to make comparisons between substrates and between enzymes. And to my knowledge, this is the first studies of their kind, others have looked at relative rate constants and not drawn any conclusions about the magnitudes or the isotope effects on the kinetic parameters. Uh, what gives rise to the deuterium isotope effect on oxygen consumption? Well, uh, it appears that um, there is an exchange process uh, that occurs in the absence of oxygen. If you just take cyclooxygenase and a labeled fatty acid in proteo buffer uh, and incubate it with a wild type enzyme or with this uh, tyrosine uh, 334F variant, you see the growth of this signal at 309 that corresponds to this, the incorporation of a single proteum into the unreacted per deuterated substrate. So that means that the initial hydrogen atom abstraction step, the initiating step, is reversible. And that, in it of itself, uh, was somewhat controversial because the isotope effects mentioned, uh, mentioned previously uh, were interpreted to mean that that step was the first irreversible rate limiting step that dictated the nature of the products formed does not appear to be the case. Um, control experiments show that without protein, you don't see exchange. And if you mutate that catalytic tyrosine to a non redox active phenylalanine, there's no exchange either. So basically, we have evidence here that uh, thermodynamically, the initial hydrogen atom abstraction step is reversible. If oxygen is let into the system, you don't see any exchange, and that's because oxygen traps the putative fatty acid radical faster than exchange can occur with the solvent. 
Okay, looking at uh, the, deter the temperature dependence of isotopic effects, uh, we've looked at uh, the temperature dependence of the isotope effect on the turnover rate constant and the rate constant at low oxygen concentrations. So physiologically relevant oxygen concentrations, less than 50 micromolar in other words. And uh, as I already mentioned, uh, the, in the wild type enzyme, there's a big isotope effect on the turnover rate constant, somewhat smaller isotope effect on KCAT over KM oxygen. But if you look at the activation parameters, this is where uh, you see the quantum mechanical features cropping in. There's virtually no difference in activation energy. And if you extrapolate to infinite temperature, the isotope effect arises from what we call the Arrhenius prefactor. And that can be attributed exclusively to nuclear tunneling. So this big isotope effect is due to nuclear tunneling. That is not to say that when nuclear tunneling occurs, isotope effects must be big. They can be small. But in enzymes in general, because the substrate's held some distance away from the reactive site, protein dynamics are important and um, <laughs> thermal activation can be necessary. And that is uh, indicated by this behavior down here when we look at the rate constant KCAT over KM, oxygen versus temperature, uh, the steeper uh, slope for the deuterated linoleic acid uh, is indicative of a, a thermally activated process. So uh, what we propose is that KCAT uh, at O2 saturation and linoleic acid saturation is determined by this initial hydrogen tunneling step. And uh, the isotope effect on KCAT over KM oxygen is determined by this final step where the hydrogen's initially abstracted, oxygen traps at either the 9 position or the 13 position, and then the fatty acid peroxyl radical has to reorganize extensively in the active site to re-abstract that hydrogen from the tyrosine and regenerate the active catalyst. So we could explain all of that behavior. And we've seen this before in, a, in a, an analog model, if you will, uh, of cyclooxygenase from a plant enzyme. And basically what this is showing is that at low oxygen, uh, the rate limiting step is the reduction of the peroxyl radical by the the reduced tyrosine, but as oxygen concentration is increased, this barrier decreases. This is um, a free energy profile, and the rate limiting step becomes the initial hydrogen abstraction. So uh, that is the interpretation of what's going on with wild type cyclooxygenase 2. Um, upon uh, Further experimentation, we looked at the competitive isotope effect on linoleic acid oxidation with the wild type and this, this variant. And you see this hyperbolic trend in the competitive isotope effect um, where the maximum value is not K-cat as it is in, in the previous scenario, but K-cat over KM oxygen. So the maximum competitive KIE converges to the isotope effect on oxygen consumption. And that indicates that the same irreversible step is controlling the products formed at low substrate physiologically relevant concentrations. Okay, so I said that we could explain this based on a random sequential mechanism. I'm not going to belabor this too much, only to say that there's a ternary complex formed by uh, random binding of either the fatty acid or oxygen initially to the protein, that this uh, step where the peroxyl radical swings around and removes the hydrogen is the first irreversible step, and therefore we see uh, the O18 KIEs and the the large deuterium uh, isotope effects or the, the anomalous temperature-dependent deuterium isotope effects.
With arachidonic acid, this is a bit more surprising because you have to under, there has to be multiple <laughs> uh, five exocyclization steps, and these all involve high energy radical intermediates. Well, this might make some uncomfortable to think that a carbon carbon bond forming event could be reversible. Granted, this is a radical intermediate, and I'll show you data which support that all steps are reversible up to the same peroxyl reduction step by the reduced catalytic tyrosine. So the steps, the, the rate constants in blue are the steps that determine, that determine the products formed as well as the isotope effects. I'm not going to go through the math, only to say that we could prove this hyperbolic dependence. Okay, so uh, we determined the isotope effects on each kinetic parameter with the wild type cyclooxygenase, the manganese reconstituted enzyme shows the same behavior. Tyrosyl radical is the reactive species as expected. The isotope effects are indistinguishable with an experimental error. Uh, with the, uh, the mutant, however, we see the same large isotope effect on each of the kinetic parameters. And what this means is that the same step is rate limiting, or it's the same irreversible step during catalysis. <coughs> That's the easiest explanation for this behavior. And this drove us to reanalyze uh, the isotope effect on the reaction of the enzyme with the native substrate. And this is the first time a large isotope effect has been uncovered in cyclooxygenase enzymes. We see a somewhat larger value in COX-1, but I'm not going to go into that because of the complicated phenol dependence. With COX-2, we see a value uh, of about 18, and uh, as I'll show you in a moment, a temperature dependence, which is consistent, again, with nuclear tunneling in the first irreversible step. Uh, Further evidence in support of this mechanism comes from these competitive isotope, uh, oxygen isotope effects determined by isotope ratio mass spectrometry. Uh, with the wild type and the, and the variant reacting with linoleic acid, we see virtually the same oxygen isotope effect. And the same is true with arachidonic acid where the isotope effect is somewhat larger. And the fact that the isotope effect is somewhat larger is consistent with all of those uh, initial steps, uh, that is, initial hydrogen atom abstraction, trapping of the putative radical, carbon radical, all the cyclization steps uh, being reversible prior to the uh, peroxyl radical being reduced in the first irreversible step. And finally, as far as temperature studies go, I, I think I've mentioned that uh, the uh, behavior of uh, the cyclooxygenase um, with linoleic acid uh, is best described by quantum mechanical hydrogen transfer. Same appears to be true for arachidonic acid, although we don't have great precision in our numbers. What we can say is the larger barriers associated with the, uh, the oxygen consumption as well as the turnover of the enzyme is consistent with those exocyclization steps being reversible and contributing to the energetic cost of the reaction. That is, the barriers are twice as high as what you see with linoleic acid where the cyclization steps are not present. So, with that, what we've learned is that uh, peroxidase catalysis must be uh, studied independently of dioxygenase catalysis by saturating with an antioxidant like phenol. There's a branch point in the cycle where a tyrosyl radical is formed and uh, it abstracts a hydrogen bound closely to uh, that site. The hydrogen is retained at that tyrosine during catalysis. Oxygen traps the delocalized carbon radical, forms this peroxyl radical, which reabstracts the hydrogen from that tyrosine and gives rise to deuterium kinetic isotope effects when protium is replaced by deuterium. So 
we, for the first time, have evidence of a detailed mechanism of this enzyme and isotope discrimination in the process. And finally, I want to say something about anti-cancer, uh, adjuvants and anti-cancer chemotherapies. Uh, COX-2 inhibitors are believed to be adjuvants and anti-cancer chemotherapies because they block the metabolo metabolism of endogenous cannabinoids. Now, endogenous cannabinoids are named after the, the receptor for the psychoactive ingredient in cannabis. They have no structural resemblance to that molecule. This is just like a, an arachidonic acid derivative with an ethanolamide tail. Anandamide is the name given to it. It's in Sanskrit, it's called the molecule of bliss because it is actually involved in a wide range of cognitive functions. Uh, as well as mood and uh, a number of other interesting uh, pathophysiological events such as inflammation and neuropsychiatric s syndromes and uh, immune function. And it's believed that inhibiting endocannabinoid metabolism by COX-2 uh, gives rise to selective apoptosis of cancer cells. And finally, there is one nuance that we have begun to study, and that is the regulation of cyclooxygenase 2 uh, endocannabinoid metabolism by nitric oxide. Turns out that cyclooxygenase 2 is co-expressed with nitric oxide synthase in the same cells that make endocannabinoids. So it stands to reason that there should be an effect of NO on, its re on cyclooxygenase reactivity. Well, these studies were done with arachidonic acid, and in fact, um, or sorry, these studies were done with anandamide. You see that anandamide and arachidonic acid show similar kinetic parameters, although the turnover rate content is somewhat greater with the anandamide substrate. When treated with nitric oxide, human COX-2 shows rate acceleration, uh, whereas COX-1 does not. And this is uh, further evidence that nitric oxide is modulating the activity. And we expect that this effect should be greater when anandamide is the substrate. Uh, we've detected no real difference in product distributions except for the formation of acyclic peroxide. It seems to be somewhat greater when the COX-2 is treated with nitric oxide. And rather than uh, read these two, you can read them yourself, yourself I, I just want to point out once again that the discrimination factors that are responsible uh, for the effect, the adjuvant effect of deuterium depleted water when certain anti cancer chem chemotherapeutics that speed up fatty acid metabolism are administered may arise from the coupling of multiple fatty acid oxidizing enzymes. You have to get to a discrimination factor of nearly 7,000 in order to account for the effect of one deuterium in, in, in almost 7,000 uh, protons. And uh, potentially, it is the accumulation of metabolites caused by these fatty acid uh, oxidizing enzymes that gives rise to the effect caused by uh, deuterium depleted water on cancer cell growth. That I'd like to thank all those that contributed and our funding uh, sources, and again the organizers for the kind invitation. I'd like to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you. <laughs>